We're going to talk about, uh, <coughs> about aluminum alloys <coughs> and uh, the strengthening mechanism and the process of DT. Uh, this is the outline of the presentation I just wanted to, to, to give you today. I'm going to talk uh, about, let's say, a summary of the strategies to, we need to adopt control and solidification. And then uh, long term addition of inoculants will be focused particularly. And uh, then we will move on to the opportunity for thermal treatment, considering both uh, these inoculants and some other procedures that may be formed to strengthen the alarm, targeting the increase of strength, but also considering the stress relaxation, the control of residual stresses. And finally, we can draw some conclusions. So this is just to, to, to focus on what we are talking about. So, uh, all of us, uh, we know that uh, if we try to bring this uh, kind of uh, aluminum tech silicon, life is easy, we can get a very nice structure structure on, on the right side, on the left side, you know, uh, without any defects, basically. But when we try to move to high strength steel, conventional, let's say, let's go this way, conventional high strength steel, such as this uh, 2024 alloy, it's a disaster, we get a lot of cracks. So we need to change something, we need to control something more carefully. And uh, what we could do is, is somehow summarizing this kind of sketch. Let me use this sketch just to make a summary about uh, some things, some concepts that are already known from welding metallurgy uh, and from uh, manufacturing as well. So during solidification, especially when the, the <coughs> uh, freezing time and freezing, uh, and, uh, solidification interval is quite large, you see that we can uh, get a bit of growth of uh, quite long uh, columnar grain, and uh, here we get the uh, generation of uh, very long channels of liquid in the very last stage of solidification. And when you start accumulating residual st stretch shrinkage stresses, then you can get cracks. <laughs> uh, um, possible solution is to decrease the freezing range, as has, has been told uh, several times today in several sessions and uh, you see here in the schem schematic uh, uh, plot if you can decrease the length and make, make available a larger amount of liquid especially in the last stage of solidification then you can improve the situation. Other strategy, alternative strategy is to generate somehow the condition for nucleating many grains in the liquid uh, so uh, using inoculants uh, to create equiax grain replacing the columnar grain, so that uh, <coughs> at the very last stage of solidification, the liquid uh, film can, can be distributed more homogeneously in a less crit critical uh, distribution. Uh, so, uh, again, as a summary, uh, in order to heal or to avoid or to limit uh, generation of cracks, especially in high strength uh, aluminum alloy, uh, what we can do is uh, written there, so reducing solidification range increasing the amount of liquid made available in the last stage of solidification. And here, for instance, you can get some example. Aluminum 4 copper, it's just an experimental alloy we generated in our laboratory, and uh, it's special, just an exercise, and you see that uh, you can get a lot of cracks after, after uh, laser beam uh, powder, uh, <coughs> LPPF anyway. And uh, this is the Shire uh, solidification curve okay, showing that there is a quite large, very large solidification interval. But for instance, uh, uh, if you are able to improve, to increase the amount of uh, uh, liquid available in that stage, uh, for instance, by generating a larger amount of eutectic, even increasing the amount of copper with some strain, because copper is quite dangerous for this from this perspective, you can heal the cracks, you can avoid any cracks. A lot of things also change if you change so much the, 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 the composition, but just to tell you that you can do something against that. The other way, way out for, uh, in order to avoid uh, cracks is to, oh sorry, what is, what is, what is, is to use some inoculants, such as uh, titanium borrow, which is a well-known inoculants inoculant for, for casting alloys, for aluminum casting alloys. Again, from the solidification curve, you see that uh, titanium boron is available is in the solid form, uh, already at very high temperature, the cooling down, you see that this, uh, 
So these particles then will last state before aluminum, so if the patient gets aluminum three titanium, usually you get an excess of titanium in those alloy in order to help uh, nucleation of new phases. And from here, you get nucleation of the alpha aluminum starting from those nuclei, which is quite useful. Um, and this is the resulting microstructure, which is very nice, with lots of uh, tiny equiax brain. Uh, alternative solutions are, and again, this is well known, uh, the use of scandium or scandium and zirconium or even titanium in order to produce uh, um, L12 type uh, particles that match very, very easily and very uh, conveniently the aluminum matrix in order to, be, uh, to promote the yeah, nucleation of the grains. Uh, um, well, well uh, scandium is well known. Alloy is the first alloy that came in my, comes in my mind uh, that uses this strategy. They, 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 they proposed the, the alloy lots of years ago. And uh, but scandium is quite critical. It's a critical raw material for Europe. It's very expensive. So it has a lot of, uh, let's say, drawbacks. Uh, you can also use uh, zirconium uh, replacing scandium or in addition, so uh, together with scandium. Uh, if you compare the two binary phase diagram, aluminum with scandium, aluminum with zirconium, then you can see that they, they do have a quite similar shape, not that much because this is a detective. Oh, sorry, I know this. I know this wrong intuition. I don't know this is a detective, this is a very detective. Anyway, but it doesn't matter. Uh, it, you, you see that there is a kind of uh, solubility limit from the liquid in order to create uh, the new aluminum tree scanning rather than the zirconium phases. And the good point is that in order to be effective in nucleating new phases, you have to stay this side of the phase diagram or this side of the phase diagram. It means that you need to use at least, what I read here, 0.5 or 0.6% scanning, weight percent scanning, or at least 0.1, uh, 0.2% zirconium. Or you can mix them together and the combination of the two, so you can save uh, scandium and uh, add zirconium instead of it in order to be effective in nucleating new phases from the aluminum matrix. And, uh, sorry, okay, we can move back here. Again, this is a, uh, uh, here we were using an aluminum 5 magnesium uh, alloy with 0.8% uh, zirconium and only 0.3% scandium. Actually, it's a commercial <coughs> alloy made available by M4P company. And uh, uh, this is the solidification curve. First, you start with aluminum 3 zirconium. And the very last stage here, you get aluminum 3 combined aluminum 3 scandium and zirconium. And then you start with solidification of the aluminum market giving rise to uh, this, again, this uh, equiaxed uh, uh, grain structure. And it's fine here that you can already also see very clearly the starting inoculants that were affected in creating the new grains. Uh, uh, <coughs> OK, sorry, go back. OK, uh, one thing that you can do by using CALFAD method for, for the simulation is to, okay, to uh, calculate the solidification curve according to shy weaver uh, hypothesis, which are uh, more, mostly accepted for this kind of process. And you can learn about the composition of the alpha aluminum uh, solid solution while you are running along this line here, so during solidification. <coughs> and you can plot, now we can move to this slide here, you can plot uh, the, the amount of uh, zirconium and scandium within the alpha solid solution over the, against the temperature, I mean, uh, uh, from the very first uh, stage where you can see the first, uh, look, uh, the first uh, alpha aluminum uh, fraction to the end of certification, uh, at least considering alpha aluminum alone, okay? It means that uh, we are considering, let's say, the very first stage here corresponds to the cell core, grain core, the very first fraction volume of, uh, of uh, alpha aluminum that is formed around the nucleus. And then, while moving down here, and while moving down around this, uh, along this scale here, then you can see the different uh, composition. Okay. We discretized somehow uh, the different layer, okay? 
of the of the <laughs> of the of the grain, and we can get an information about the composition step by step from the cell core or grain core, sorry for the name, down to cell boundary or grain boundary. And then you can translate. Oh, oh sorry. Then you can uh, uh, make another calculation considering the precipitation behavior with this this kind of grain, uh, let's say, chemistry of the grain or gradient of the chemistry of the grain using Prisma. Uh, for instance, in this case, in the, in the, in the graph in the center, we can see the aging at 350 degree and plot uh, the volume fraction of the of the of the scattered of zirconium rich particle against the time. So again, con uh, consistently with a different color, we can see that uh, at the grain, uh, grain, grain uh, center, grain core, we expect to have a given incubation time and then a quite large amount of uh, particles that potential can go. Okay? But then you can uh, progressively move to the grain boundary where uh, close to the boundary, you still have some solid particles at the very beginning, or I don't know, in a very, very short time, theoretically speaking. And uh, while the amount of available elements to, to, to form particles is a little bit lower. So, all in all, you can imagine that there might be within the grains a given uh, uh, precipitation behavior, and this is also translated or results in. Uh, given, uh, let's say, hardness evolution over the time during aging, aging at 350 degrees. So, keeping the same example, 350 is the red dashed line which goes through this trend here. But also you can have uh, different trends uh, with uh, slightly lower or slightly higher temperatures. Uh, now, uh, we, we shall move in the, for the second part of this uh, talk. Uh, to, let's say, to other kind of uh, maybe commercial alloys. Quite often you see in, on, uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the portfolio of companies and startups, big companies or startups that are selling powders, aluminum powders, uh, some kind of almost standard alloys, talking about 2000 series, 6000 series, 7000 series, plus something, plus titanium bottom, plus zirconium, plus scandium, in order to he cracks to prevent cracks, sorry, right? And it's, fun. it's it's quite interesting to to consider this kind of double time of aging behavior we may face. <laughs> sorry, uh, um, I could say that is not that's, that's not scientific. It's my choice, but I, I just I was just considering that we can uh, have to deal with two types of precipitation. Let's say, uh, let's put it this way. One type of precipitation concerns aluminum three something, scandium, titanium, uh, um, zirconium, combination of them, which of course takes, takes place at high temperature, 320, 50, 400, 450, and so on. Second type is the more conventional uh, precipitation strengthening particles, uh, which are well known in standard uh, 2000, 7000, 6000 alloys, talking about. Uh, Beta prime S type in 2000 alone, talking about beta prime in 6000, uh, eta in 7000, and so on, the many others. So there's kind of overlapping uh, between these two particles. First thing, to, first thing to, thing to consider is that already during the, if, if, we, if, if we try to think to the conventional T6 temper for aluminum alloy, what happens? Already during the uh, so called solution annealing, carried out at high temperature, we still have, we already have a kind of precipitation referred to the first type of, oh sorry again, to the first type of uh, uh, precipitate. So already during, during the uh, so-called so solution annealing, we get precipitation of aluminum tree, scandium aluminum tree, titanium and so on. And this is kind of, uh, this is an experimental a test we made on a modified 24 alloy plus titanium and boron. Titanium takes lots of, uh, uh, produces this kind of uh, uh, strengthening at high temperature. And even though we talk about solution treatments, here we have precipitation, which is very clear. Um, <coughs> second point to consider is that for the second type of precipitation, so the usual theta uh, prime, uh, beta and so on, uh, we need to, again, to find out the right strategy. Uh, this morning, uh, uh, 
uh, <coughs> colleague of mine from Polytechnic in Torino already spent a few uh, spent uh, some some time talking about that this part here. Um, the, the structure that comes out from from uh, this part of fusion is very fine, very nice, and is uh, the result of, of a very uh, fast cooling. Okay, so we can presume that already we can have already lots of uh, uh, elements uh, uh, in solid solution, so it's already super saturated. When we do T six to measure T six treatment, solution again, again we destroy this is very nice structure. It's a pity actually. So the, the question is, uh, uh, is it really, do we really need to do solution annealing again? It's not, we already have a, a super saturated solid solution. And then also we can consider that uh, the repeated thermal cycles, they produce already a kind of heating or in situ heat treatments. We can exploit that somehow if we want. Uh, just to tell you something more, uh, here we have a kind of test, uh, a number of tests made on a uh, 10 silicon magnesium alloy uh, with the DSC, with the calorimeter. Uh, the conventional T6 temper gives this kind of curve during aging, so it means that with solution treated, uh, some, some sample, and then with the aging in the calorimeter to see the two expected peak corresponding to the strengthening particles. And uh, if you do the same uh, on uh, as bit sample, so without any prior solution treatment, actually you get the same. It means that no need for doing the, uh, the solution treatment. If you repeat the experiment using uh, an as bit sample, that which was produced by uh, printing in the hot stage with the hot platform already at 160 degrees, so already at the aging temperature, flat line, meaning that, sorry, meaning that uh, uh, there is no reaction, uh, there is no further precipitation, there is no need of doing the aging. Uh, this is consistent with the, with the images here and with the increasing hardness when we, uh, you, when we do the aging uh, on the as-built uh, sample with the cold plate and no need, uh, nothing takes place, of course, when we use the hot uh, stage or hot uh, plate. Uh, just another point and then we can uh, uh, close. Um, uh, we were talking about the type, first type and second type of, of, uh, of precipitates that uh, can uh, grow during the aging. Okay, so th these are some, again, some more <coughs> images, some more 10 images, EM images, about 2024 alloy doped with titanium and boron. What you can see, again, very nice, very small grain, the nucleus the particles here reach in titanium, very nice. But after the sixth temper, what you can also realize is that uh, it's not a single phase here. We have two different phases. So this, there is a kind of heterogeneous precipitation, okay? And uh, you can uh, recognize but many, many evidence, but here, for instance, I was putting the uh, uh, microbial analysis this is rich in titanium, as expected, but also rich in copper. So it means that copper goes <coughs> on to these particles, and uh, in, some, in some cases it prevents uh, proper uh, an, effect, an effective strengthening by the second type of precipitation, which is quite important. So you lose the potential for strengthening of copper and some other elements uh, by, by, uh, by having some nucleus that collect and gather and get them. Uh, all those, uh, those elements. Finally, residual stresses. Uh, yeah, we have to choose a strategy, but do not forget about residual stresses. I was telling you before that uh, you can use, uh, we can go straight to aging if you can, if you want to save time and to keep a very nice microstructure. This could hold for small particles, small pieces, small components. Because if you have to control the uh, residual stress, you you cannot forget that we need to stay at high temper temperature for some period. Again, <coughs> these are some experiments we did uh, by, by printing some usual cantilever sample, and then you can cut on the base here and measure how much is the flexion, which is an indication of the residual stress. But uh, also, we could we, we double checked by using a diffractometer to measure residual stresses, and that's what, what comes out. That comes, comes out. Uh, as we its uh, material has a uh, lot of uh, uh, tensile residual stresses, you can do uh, 
This is temporal, and you can uh, erase or modify and reduce dramatically the receiver stresses. This is a good point, but you know you you lose some some potential somehow. Uh, <coughs> uh, talking about high temperature aging in order to promote the precipitation of the aluminum scandium, aluminum uh, titanium, aluminum zirconium. Uh, here you can see that high temperature aging is only able to reduce the residual stress down to very low value. So uh, there are a lot of, uh, let's say, parameters and uh, issues to be considered. This is why these are some summarizing sentences. Thank you for your attention. Thank you.